just joined us this morning, but forgive me. All right, so welcome everybody who is joining us live. We are in Matthew chapter 5, continuing in our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever told. Now today, we have an interesting passage that we read. We read verses 17 through 20, where Jesus talks about being the fulfillment of the law. The fulfillment of the law. Now when we think about the law, we think of grace, and we think about how these things play in Scripture, where we read elsewhere in Scripture, we think of old versus New Testament a lot of times. And how that all fits together. You know, we're under the new covenant of God. So therefore, we're under the, the we're, 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 we live in a New Testament world. So the Old Testament, it's nice to look at, but it really doesn't have a whole lot of relevance. It's kind of how a lot of people see it. I remember talking to a Christian man from the Middle East one time. And he said something to me that stuck with me. And, and I've, I've, I've run it through my head many times and I don't think it was right. Because what he told me was, he says... I love the New Testament. It's like the sequel to the old. I thought about that. You know, because he was trying to say it's the new improved version. But in reality, I don't think he's right. Because the, old te- the New Testament is not the sequel to the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. They are all work together. It's all God's word. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But... What we have to understand of why is Jesus talking about these things? He's talking to a group of people who know the law. He's talking to a group of people who were awaiting a Messiah. And now he's saying, look, I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill that. Now, what does that mean? <coughs> what does that mean? Now, in order to understand the importance of the Old Testament, in today's society, we have to answer a couple of fundamental questions. The first question is this. Is God the same in the Old Testament as in the New Testament? This is what we have to answer this. Because if we would, otherwise, we have to look, if we, as many people will dismiss the God of the Old Testament, as they would, they even make a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, how the Old Testament God is, is vengeful and wrathful and judgmental and, and, and horrible. And the New Testament is loving, kind, and hippie-like. Okay? <laughs> All right? So, we have to ask ourselves this question. Is God the same in both? And then we have to ask the question is, does the Old Testament have relevance, and do we need to study it today? Do we need to study it today? If the answer to the first question is yes, then it actually has a major effect on how we answer the second one, don't you think? So, I want to dig into these questions this morning because it lends us some understanding of what Jesus meant by he came to fulfill the law. Now, so the first question we have is, is God the same in the New Testament, in the Old Testament as we do? Okay? Now, what I put up here, recently we went through a sermon series on the attributes of God. And we went over a lot of these things. Okay? So, if those are the attributes of God, we need to see if all of those attributes exist of God and are true of God in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Kind of makes sense, right? Okay, so, we must first look at this to see in what way we think he might be different. So, I think the best way to determine this is by looking at these attributes. And here's what I mean, okay? Attributes of God, these are inherent qualities of God. <laughs> They define his existence. They are essential to the truth of who God is. Now, if we can determine that God exhibits these qualities, like I said in both the Old and the New Testament, then he hasn't changed. So, do I believe that God exhibits all these qualities in both the Old and New Testament? Yeah, I do. Okay? I'm going to give you a kind of a... A synopsis or an overview of all those passages. You know, you know, if you want them from me, you can get them from me later. Oh, okay. But I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna throw them all down there. But give you an idea. So let's talk about holiness real quick. Holiness means to be set apart. God is distinct from simple man. He's distinct from his creation. In Isaiah six three, in, uh, um, the prophet describes God in the throne room of God and says He is holy, holy, holy. You know what the throne room of God says about Him in Revelation four eight? He is holy, holy, holy. Old Testament, New Testament. We see it in both. But what about God's love? Well, in Psalm chapter 5, verse 7, 
by God's great love, David was able to come into his house and worship. And in the New Testament, in John 3, 16, we see for God so love. And even in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, we see God is love. So we do see the, the attribute of God's love in both the Old and the New Testament. His goodness is what disposes God to be kind and benevolent and full of goodwill towards men. And it allows him to extend that mercy that he has towards men as a product of his love. In Exodus chapter 33, 19 in the Old Testament, God speaks of his mercy and goodness. When Moses took to Moses, when he passed in front of him and Moses got to see a part of his shadow. And in Mark 10, 18, Jesus himself says, no one is good but God alone. So we see God's goodness in both the Old and the New Testament. And I know I'm breezing through these pretty quick because this is just setting the foundation for what's to come. His omnipotence means God is all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth. Nothing is too hard for you. And we know in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority is given to Christ. Omnipresence means he's present everywhere at the same time. And in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24 in the Old Testament, the prophet says, Who can hide? Or God says, who can hide where I cannot see them? In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. His omnipresence is seen in both the old and the new. His omniscience means he's all-knowing. He knows, that means he knows all that has happened, all that will happen, all that can happen, and all that is happening. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth and in John 16 30 the disciples said to Jesus now we can see that you know all things God's justice means that he has the ability to set a standard and judge all creation based upon it and therefore he enforces that equally and partially and all inclusively and in Isaiah 28, 17, in the Old Testament, God says he will make justice his measuring line. And in the New Testament, in the epistle of Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, it says anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrong. There is no favoritism. Independence means that God does not need us. It's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. God doesn't need us. He didn't make us because he needed us. He didn't create us because he needed to. And in Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were before, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And in Acts, he says, he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything from us. He is eternal. He always has existed and always will. At the burning bush, in the episode of the burning bush, next to this chapter 3 with Moses, he called himself Yahweh, I am who I am, the self-existing one, the one who's ever present, who always has been. And in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Sovereignty. God reigns through His power. He's in control of all things. In Isaiah 25, 8, the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all the faces and remove His people's disgrace from the earth. And in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus speaks of the Father doing what he is pleased to do. Now this last one, we've got to hang on for a second. Because this really answers the question. To be immutable means you do not change. And in Psalm 102, 25 through 27, it says, You remain the same, your years will never end. And in Hebrews chapter 1 in the New Testament, verse 12, it says, You remain the same, your years will never end. So I believe we have evidence and cause to say that God does not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He didn't shift from judgmental to loving. He's always been judgmental and loving throughout history. In light of these passages, especially about the one about his immutability, we can, I think we can make the case that he's the same. It's the same God. Then the question remains, it's like, 
then why is it that he seems, at least a lot of people, he seems to act differently towards us? Such as the whole law versus grace thing. And I, I, I say that's a fair question. I say that's a fair question. The answer to this question is in something, a type of theology called covenant theology. And this is, gonna, this is important to understand because it, it cycles a biblical narrative throughout the entirety of scripture that lead from creation to fall to redemption to new creation. These cycles go throughout the Bible in these little mini cycles and in one gigantic cycle called the plan of redemption. And this is what we're going to talk about on why this is important to understand how Jesus fulfills the law like he said he did. So let's talk about covenant theology for a second, okay? Covenant theology. The New Testament writers, especially Paul, are constantly telling us that we are under a new covenant. And that we are no longer under the law of Moses, which, which by most accounts is what we see in the Old Testament. We see Moses with the Ten Commandments. We see kings labeled in their obedience to God by following his commands. We see prophets warning the people to follow the law, to obey God and turn back to him, or else. <laughs> and we see the judgment of God based upon that law. Now that law, we can get into it, but it still applies to us today, especially the moral aspect of that law. But if we're under grace and not under the law, if that's no longer what we're held to, how on earth is it relevant in today's world? World. Um, so, how is learning about this kind of interaction between God and man, one that is based on the law, why is that important to me? That's that second question. Now, to answer that question, we have to have a grasp of this covenant theology. Throughout the Old Testament, God made covenants, promises, agreements, contracts, if you will, with his people and with various people. And I'm going to highlight a few of the major ones. Okay? First one. It's not the first one, but it's actually one major one. The first one I'm going to go over to this morning. Okay? And that's the covenant he made with Noah. See, God blesses Noah. And he tells him after the flood and he's destroyed everything to do what? Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Okay? And we see Noah give a, a sacrifice and, and he promises never to destroy the world by a flood again. The whole rainbow thing, right? Okay? And that shows God's desire to bless and continues to establish a line of redemption through one of his sons. Shem. So, so Noah had three sons that, that survived the flood with him, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem is the line that ultimately leads to the next guy, Abraham. Now in Abraham, God promises in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, God promises to make him into a great nation and his descendants will be a blessing to all people. So Abraham is of the Semitic line, the line of Shem, from Noah. God is continuing his promise, be fruitful and multiply. And now he's saying, look, I'm going to take that multiplication and I'm going to turn it into a mighty and powerful nation. A.K.A. Semitic nation. A.K.A. Israel. Okay. Now, later on we see a covenant made with another guy from this line. God named Moses. And he creates, or he, uh, God gives him the law, the commandments, all of those 600 laws for civil laws and, and uh, dietary laws and, um, and moral laws. And the law was made for two purposes. Number one, it was to show how to live as God's people. God gave Moses the law and said, you're going to go into this promised land, this land that I promised your ancestor Abraham. You're going to go into this land, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this promise, and you need to behave this way when you go in there. You need to do these things. That's how you're going to live as God's people. But there's another thing that the law does, and we read about this in the book of Romans, chapter 7. The law also was made to demonstrate the people's inability to follow it. I know that sounds weird. Okay? That's sin, though. 
Because of sin, people were not able to follow that law to perfection. So thereby, what it does is it directs them to their need and their understanding of their need for a Savior. So God said, okay, so let, we're, we're tracing this covenant theology down. We say, be fruitful and multiply? Okay. Shem goes out and does that. Eventually, through that line, we see Abraham. Abraham, he is promised to be a nation and a great nation, and, and, and all the people are going to be blessed through him. One of his descendants, and he promises him the land. One of his descendants, Moses, takes him into that land and now gives him a law that says, This is how you're supposed to behave in this land. But guess what? You're not going to be able to fulfill it. So I want to remind everybody that you still need me as your God. Because you can't do it because you're sinful. Now, over time, people started to get anxious, they started to get grumbly, and they wanted a king, and they got a date, so they chose the good-looking guy, and he wasn't the right guy. But God chose his own guy. His name was David. Now, David is of the line of Judah. And the line of Judah was the kingly line. It was established through David. So Moses' descendant David becomes the king appointed by God. And it said, and the covenant that God made with David was, your line is going to rule forevermore. There will, a king will be on the throne from your line. And this is why in the New Testament, we read genealogies of Jesus, tracing him back to King David, because he was of that line. He is the king that, that goes all the way back to the promise that his was Abraham's descendant was going to bless all nations, we see that through Jesus himself. See, Jesus is that guy who's going to come, and he's going to forgive sin, and he's going to give men the ability to fulfill the law where they couldn't do it in and of themselves because he's the only perfect guy. See how it all connects? See, what's really, really interesting is if you look at all of these covenants, right? They all go hand in hand. These are these little cycles throughout biblical history that keep repeating. There are more to them. There are, there are more in there. These are the major guys, okay? But there are more. And they go cycle by cycle by cycle by cycle. And they're going in there. But what God is ultimately doing through all of this is if you look at it as a whole, and not with each of these individual little cycles, you see one big, gigantic cycle. One big, gigantic covenant. That started back in the Garden of Eden and ends in the new heaven and the new earth. And that is what's called the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption. What does redemption mean? Okay? The Hebrew word refers to someone who will fulfill the duties of a deceased husband, ensuring that property and inheritance was maintained, and even avenging murder as necessary. Okay. In other words, a redeemer was someone who would take care of a widow and their family and fix the trouble that was there. That's what a redeemer was. You kind of bring things back together the way they're supposed to be. And that could happen in the form of a payment or whatever. So here's the deal. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of sin, we fall into a state of trouble. We need a redeemer to come and fix it. Someone to ensure our inheritance. Our inheritance, as we've been told, is the one in glory. But we can't get there because of our sin. We're broken. So how does God fix it? How do who's going to be the redeemer? Well, we know that that redemption came to pay the price that we owe through Jesus Christ, in the form of Jesus Christ. He purchased our salvation on the cross. He paid our debt. We deserve to hang on the cross because of our sin. But he took it for us. And when he did that, our inheritance was made secure. But what the Old Testament teaches us is how that came to fruition. And it, it is a running theme that is woven around the Old Testament. Here's the basic shell. Okay? Let's talk about at the fall of man, right? The fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, a wedge was created between us and God. In Genesis 3.15, the first messianic prophecy is issued. God's going to provide a way to fix what we broke. 
Now Genesis then traces the family line through Adam and Eve's son Seth all the way to Noah. And after the flood, God instructs Noah and his family, like I said, to be fruitful and multiply. And one of those guys is Shem, as I mentioned before, and his descendants were known as the Semites. The Bible traces his line specifically to Abraham. That's a Semitic tribe. Now God promises Abraham he will become a great nation and all the people of the world will be blessed through him. And we take this ultimate blessing to mean the promise of the Messiah. However, famine drove him away and into the land of Egypt where over time the Hebrews were enslaved until this guy named Moses leads them out. We find these in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. See how the Old Testament started to come together now, right? The land that God promised Abraham is the destination and under the leadership of a man named Joshua, the Israelites conquered the land and settled. We read about that in the book of Joshua. Eventually, things start to get bad. So Israel demands a king, and God does not necessarily want this, but the people do do it anyway. And the result is King Saul. And he's not too nice to God, but there is hope because his successor, the man ordained by God for the position, and his man is known as David. And in, this is the story of the stories of the kings, that both good and bad, that are found in those, what we call the history books of the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel. First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. I'm kind of walking you through the Old Testament, by the way, guys, and why this makes makes it work. Lots of stuff happened during those monarchies. Okay, lots of stuff. The land is divided into north and south. The people often chase after other gods. Wars take place, shaping the history and path of the people. And all the while, God is maintaining the promise of Messiah and delivers his words of promise and redemption and judgment on the people via the use of guys who are called prophets. You might recognize some of their names because they're books of the Bible. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Amos, Zechariah, Malachi. All of these guys, that's what they're doing. And leading up to this point after Malachi, okay, those prophets, but, uh, leading up to this point, uh, after Malachi, there's a silent period for about 400 years that takes place between the Old Testament and New Testament. And during that time, history is conquered by various empires. Believe it or not, we read about them in the book of Daniel, the various empires, the uh, Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and eventually the strongest empire, one of the most powerful that ever existed, was the Empire of Rome. Now that brings us around to the first century AD, where Rome isn't the big dog on the block, right? And we see the fulfillment of God's promised Messiah in Jesus Christ. And guess what? We're in the New Testament. It all connects. We can't dismiss the Old Testament because we don't like what it says. We don't like how God is portrayed. That's poppycock. <laughs> but it's silly. We cannot just dismiss it because this plan of redemption is seen throughout it. So when Jesus says he came to fulfill the law, this is exactly what he means. And but look at his words here. Look at his words. Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will go great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He also says that not one of the smallest letters of the, of the law is going to pass away. So there has to be some kind of importance for us. And the biggest importance is, uh, for us is to see how God works with his people. God operates with his people. Now, we are called under what's called the new covenant of the law. Or the new covenant of, of, of grace, sorry. We're under the new covenant because we're under the covenant of Jesus Christ. So, therefore, God still works with us the same way he did these guys. Taking us from creation, he creates us, to fall, we're sinful, to redemption, we come to Christ, to new creation. And what does Paul say that we are in Christ? New creations. And ultimately, he's going to bring about the ultimate new creation, the new heaven and the new earth in the future. Starting in Genesis, go straight through to the maps. 
<laughs> what does studying this plan of redemption do for us? Why? 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 That's the question. Why? Okay. I came up with some ideas here that I thought uh, make a little bit of sense about why we should study the Old Testament. And the first thing is it points to Christ as the Messiah. It shows how he actually fulfills what was promised in the Old Testament. It solidifies our faith that he is indeed the Savior. It gives us confidence in the love and sovereignty of God. Because as we understand it, we can know it and we can trust it. Because why? We've seen it fulfilled throughout all of those cycles. And ultimately, then, if we can see it fulfilled through all of these cycles in history, then we can see it, see and have faith that it's going to fulfill in the way, in the larger picture, in the plan of redemption. God doesn't change. And if we've established that, then we know that by studying the Old Testament, we're going to get a better understanding of who he is, the nature of God, and how we relate to him. So the Old Testament is important. Something I did not touch on a lot, but I have to at least mention, is it helps us to understand the background and the history of Jesus and our faith as a whole. The people he was interacting with, it helps us understand where they're coming from and why there was so much beef, you know, between Jesus and the Pharisees and who the Sadducees were and who all these people were. And why the heck were they constantly bickering at each other? <laughs> Consider, and like I said, consider the reasons why Matthew and Luke included genealogy of Jesus. See, with an understanding of the Old Testament, we get a fuller picture of the lessons that Christ was teaching about himself and his kingdom. And remember, his kingdom is what he's talking about in this sermon. It's one of the major themes of this sermon. His kingdom was established because he's on the throne of David that God established through David. So he's fulfilling that part of the covenant. He's fulfilling that part of the law. And it lays the foundation, the Old Testament lays the foundation for the teachings of Jesus, so we're better able to understand those. See, when we study the Old Testament, we better understand what Jesus Christ is talking about in the New Testament. And what Paul is talking about. We better understand the nature of sacrifice. And the culmination of God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is important. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, so therefore we cannot dismiss it. We can't. I mean, otherwise I think we're, you know, kind of disobeying what Jesus is telling us here. So I want to encourage you, when you get into your Bible, you know, I want you to read it all. It's all the story of Jesus Christ. All points to Jesus, everything. And that's the beauty of the Bible. You, know, you guys hear my tag, like, God is awesome, the Bible is cool. This is why I think the Bible is so cool. It all connects. It all inter interplays. It all comes to the culmination of Jesus Christ and what he's going to do and what he promises for our future. It's a wonderful, awesome thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful, awesome thing. So, that's my encouragement for you this morning. Okay, and uh, so I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll, we'll close our service uh, by singing one more song. Father God, I I thank you for your word, all of it, how wonderful it is. And God, I pray that you give each person here a thirst to know it, to understand it, to see how it all connects, to know how it all points to Jesus. To, to bring you glory, Father, in your awesome plan of redemption that you have given to us. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Let's, uh, close our no. Bye, guys. i got to say goodbye to our live feed. <laughs>